Welcome everyone to worship on this proper 11th Sunday in the year C of the lectionary. It's July 17th. We're here at 10.30 in the morning. Next week it'll be 7 p.m. again and the week after that will be July 31st. We'll back at 10.30 in the morning with communion. And for folks who are new with us, uh, we decided last year when we were going back into in-person worship for however long the in-person worship lasted last year, um, that on the Sundays, on the months with five Sundays, the fifth Sunday would be prayers and pajamas. Because some people really, really enjoyed staying at home during COVID and watching the service online through YouTube or Facebook with their pajamas and their coffee and their snack and just they kind of missed it when they went back to worship. It was, oh, we like to have our coffee and our snack with us. So out of solidarity for the folks who still aren't comfortable coming back yet, the fifth Sunday of the month, if you're comfortable, we do have people come in their robes and, and bring their, their travel coffee mugs and, and we have coffee and prayers and pajamas. So if you've never tried it before, don't knock it. But, uh, but you're, it's not mandatory. You can come in your regular everyday street clothes or your church clothes. You're, you're welcome to come. Okay, so I think that's it for our announcements today. So we take a breath. We allow our bodies, our hearts, and our minds to settle into God's presence. We take a breath. And we allow God's presence, love's essence, to settle into our bodies, our hearts, our minds, and souls. Let's allow our spirits to catch up with our bodies and rest a while together. Now, seeking to honor the calls to action to the church, which arose from the findings of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and wishing to to support the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. We acknowledge the traditional unceded territory of the Haisla people upon which we work and we play and we pray. We give thanks for the territory and its people and we remember as members of the wider community of Kitimat, we also commit ourselves to seeking Seeking right right relationship with with our our sisters sisters and and brothers looking for and being the face of love in the the Kitimat Valley and in the world. Okay. So remember, people of God, we don't light this candle to summon Christ, to invite Christ's light into this space because we light this candle to remind remind us us that that Christ Christ is is already already here. here. The healing, transformative light of Christ is at the center of our gathering. The The Spirit Spirit of Christ Christ is all around us and within us. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Folks, please rise as you are able. From busyness and business, God calls us to gather. From summer plans and projects, Christ Christ calls us to gather. From anxieties and worries, plan making and daydream, the Spirit Spirit of God God calls us. us into community to dream with God, to to plan plan with with spirit, to to be still with with Christ. Christ. Holy One, meet us in the place, in the space. May this time be what we need it to be so that we can receive what we come seeking, so we can be who you need us to be. Amen. Amen.
all of us in this time come with our own prayers, our own need for healing, it might be body, it might be soul, it might be everything in between. This is your time as we pray. We take a breath. Holy One, we trust that you are here with us. We trust that you love us and that you are loving us in order that we may love other folk. So in this time, if there are things that are getting in the way, if there are things distracting us, if there are things that we are anxious about, take them from us. Clear our hearts, clear our minds, clear our bodies that we may see you, hear you, feel you. Take all of those things that get between us and loving our own selves and in loving ourselves, giving us the ability to love our neighbors our sisters and brothers in Christ, your children, your world. Hold us in light. Immerse us in love. that we may taste your joy and know the assurance of your presence and your power. And we say, Amen. Hear the good news. We are loved. 
we are forgiven. forgiven. We are reconciled to God through Christ. We, we are, are reconciled to one another through grace. Thanks be to God for second chances and unconditional love. Amen. I miss the days when we would say peace be with you and also with you and then we would run around this room hugging each other and saying hello and all the introverts would be like, don't touch me, don't touch me. <laughs> <sighs> I miss those days. Instead, we look around this room with as much love as we can pack into our eyeballs above our masks, <laughs> a must, as much joy and as much pleasure in seeing one another, and then we remember there are so many people out there that are still feeling isolated, still feeling alone, still scared, sad. And we know that all of those feelings of peace and love and belonging and welcome and value, all of these amazing feelings that help us put our feet solid on the ground so that we can dream a little and sing a lot. We all need that, even the folks out there, especially the folks out there, because we know the secret, right? Mm. We've got the secret, which isn't a secret. <laughs> we were told very clearly, this is not a secret. Go and let people know. You're loved, you're valued, you're welcome. May the peace of Christ be with you. And, and also, also with you. you. Amen. Amen. Let our hearts be open to God's wisdom as we listen to the passage from the Hebrew Testament's book of Amos, chapter 8, verses 1 through 12. This is what the Lord showed me. A basket of summer food. God said, Amos, what do you see? I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then God said to me, the end has come upon my people of Israel. I will never again pass them by. The songs of the temple shall be wail become wailings in that day, says God. The dead bodies shall be many, cast out in every place. Be silent. Hear this, that you that trample on the needy and bring ruin to the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain and the sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale we will make the afil small and the shekel great and practice deceit with false balances buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat god has sworn by the pride of jacob surely i will never forget any of their deeds shall not the land tremble on this account and everyone mourn who lives it and all of it rise like the Nile and be tossed about and sink again and sink again like the Nile of Egypt. On that day, says God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all of your songs into libation. I will bring sackcloth on all loins and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. The time is surely coming, says God, when I will send famine on the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but hearing the words of God, they shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of God, but shall not find it. For ancient wisdom passed down to us through our spiritual ancestors. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
Let us continue to be open to God's wisdom as we read the gospel according to Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But Jesus answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is only need of one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. For the word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Holy One, may the words of my mouth, the thoughts of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, and may they bring you glory. Amen. So many of us will remember this story from Luke's Gospel. It's one of those stories to make the crossover from Scripture, from sacred stories into secular realms. We remember what must have been, that, we remember what must have been a close-knit group of friends to Jesus, the siblings, Martha, Mary and Lazarus, their brother. We know they were close friends because Jesus wept at his death, wept not because he died, but because he knew that Lazarus would rise and be a sign of God's glory. Jesus wept because of the pain and the frustration and the anger felt by the sisters caused by his death. Wept because if Jesus had been there, it probably wouldn't happen, at least in their minds. Their brother would have been fine. It was too late for them to intervene. So these three people are, are, not, are only a few of the folk, other than the disciples and Jesus' immediate family, who are named, unlike many others who figure in his interactions but remain unidentified, anonymous people in the story. So they are significant in his life. Now, Lazarus didn't make it into this particular story, the infamous showdown between sisters Martha and Mary. Martha cleaning and fussing as only a good host should, making sure all the guests present in her home to hear Jesus were comfortable, looked after. And then there's Mary sitting there, sitting with the guests, listening, engaging in conversation, learning, certainly not being a good Jewish woman, knowing her place alongside her sister. I mean, how is Mary going to get herself a good husband if she isn't working hard alongside Mary, displaying her ability to care for the household, bringing honor to a family's name with her hospitality skills? No prospective husband will want a woman interested in learning things outside of the realm of home life and rearing babies. Mary, what are you thinking? Jesus, help me out here. Mary needs to be serving with me. And when Martha complains, assuming she'll get moral support from Jesus, instead of Jesus adding to her attempts to shame her sister into helping in the kitchen, so to speak, Jesus says, Martha, Martha. For all of us Brady Bunch generation era, I always and will forever hear those words in my head like, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There's need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which won't be taken from her. Hmm. Now, I have to confess, I have often heard other pastors and priests and ministers try to take the sting out of those words. Because churches have been born, they thrive, they survive, thanks to the Marthas on their role. Let's hear it for the Marthas. UCW, United Church Women, the Anglican Church Women, the, is it the Catholic Women's Guilds? League, okay, see? Mm. But they keep their churches afloat. Fundraisers all the time. 
while the men, they're out caring for the grounds, ensuring the plumbing is plumbed and the roofs stay leak-free and that the only thing holy is worship time. Those women, those fellas, but those Marthas throughout the decades baked and scrubbed and cooked and raised funds and sent mission workers around the world without the Marthas making turkey and spaghetti dinners, strawberry teas, sweets for bazaars, bake sales, knitting, mending, crafting, and caring, where would many of our houses of worship, it doesn't matter the denomination or even the faith expression, where would they be? Without the Marthas, where would church, temple, and synagogues be? How many committees and ministry teams, Sunday schools would be in operation without our Marthas? <sighs> That's exhausting just even listing some of those things. So I've seen many a pastor, especially my male ministry pastors, try to cushion the blow of this passage. <laughs> Jesus maybe said, Martha, Martha, when you're done, come and sit with us and listen. Martha, Martha, we'll all help out later. Put down the towel, come join us. Martha, Martha, leave your sister alone. Just come sit down. We'll worry about it later, Martha. Takes the sting out of it a little bit. But those aren't the words that Luke writes. <sighs> Jesus is written to have said, you are worried and distracted by many things. How many folks here get worried and distracted by many things? We all love worried and distracted hosts, don't we? <laughs> Makes it much easier to be comfortable in someone's home when they're worried and distracted. Don't put your boots there. Don't put your feet up. Are you going to... Come on, I made this house clean for you. I even put a little fold in the toilet paper. Wow. Nope. There's need of only one thing, and Mary has chosen the better part. What? The better part? Better than providing you and your followers with things to eat and drink and making sure your feet are dust-free, making sure you all are comfortable so you can teach and they can learn? Better than that part? Obviously, Jesus hasn't read the stats on learning success and full bellies. But that is it. Even though Martha's work seems never-ending, there's always something that needs cleaning, fixing, baking, creating, sorting, culling, doing in our homes, in our places of worship, even though there's always something that... The need to set aside those busy things to take time to be still and to listen the need to engage in sacred conversation, to talk about God and God's place in our lives, in our intentions, God's place in our dreams, our ideals, to take time to pray with each other, for each other. These things matter more. <gasps> but I've got so much to do. God will forgive me. I've got vacuuming to do. God will forgive me because my wife's to-do list is so long. I'd rather deal with God's ire than my wife's right now. <laughs> hmm. But that's it. These things matter more. They just do because after we've spent time focusing on God... After we've spent time focusing on the holy and the sacred's place in our lives, in our love, in our ability, our ability to focus on our busy tasks may take on a deeper meaning. Maybe while we cook or while we clean or while we ride the lawnmower or check the roof line, we pray. Now, when we pray, we don't find any leaks, but we pray. Maybe our time together, learning and engaging, gave us the energy that we needed to get the task, especially one we've been dreading, to get it done. Maybe we feel inspired to get that phone call, that email, that letter we've been putting off done. Maybe that ache or that angst, that pain that's been bothering us for weeks is lifted. 
and we can get to doing what we couldn't bring ourselves to do before we put on our Mary shoes and sat a while with God and God's people. Both passages today talk about priorities, sacred priorities. What things or people do we choose to make a fuss over? Do we get more angry when our cell phones stop working or when the traffic is heavy and we're running late, when our neighbor is doing that thing or not doing that thing again, than when we hear about the needy being trampled or the poor being ruined and the advantaged and the privileged taking advantage of any given situation? What makes us more angry? Maybe it is much easier to get ourselves riled up, worried and distracted, as Jesus would say, about the cleanliness of our home and the piles of our laundry or the failures of our favorite team or the latest trades, the functioning of our churches, the actions of our neighbors, the gas prices, the ineptitude of our governments, the roasts of our coffee, than it is to get worried about the welfare of the most vulnerable in our midst. You know, there's a lot of people who say that churches should stay out of politics. Meh. Maybe out of partisan politics. But everything Jesus did was political or had political implications. Caring for the neighbor, prioritizing the weak, excluding, uh, or uh, prioritizing the weak, the excluded, the broken in body and spirit, building new and healthy communities, one person, one family, one friendship circle at a time, all have political implications. Choosing to feed the multitudes, choosing to heal on a Sabbath, choosing to teach men and women were political acts. He questioned the religious authorities. He pushed back on priorities of the empire. They are still political acts. Telling people to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, the coins with Caesar's face on it, and give to God what belongs to God, which God created the whole world and everything in it and then called it all good, so that's kind of like everything else belongs to God, was a political statement. Jesus was crucified not because he was gentle, meek, and mild. He was crucified because he dared to flip tables on the temple grounds, the straw that broke the camel's back. Do not mess with the money. Bad enough he was making poor people and hurt people and lonely people feel like they mattered. But when he messed with their ability to make money and questioned their priorities and their intentions while doing it, that was it. Using the old adage, which ironically used to be de- to describe, used to be described the purpose of our free press. Is there such a thing as a free press anymore? <clears throat> Unbiased journalists. Jesus came to, quote, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. He came to bring peace, but that sacred peace rocked a lot of boats. His peace broke public and religious and cultural policies and practices into pieces. He's in that room with many of his followers, including Mary and Martha, and he is saying, check your priorities, people. What matters the most to us? Our personal comforts and worries and angst over stuff that's not in the long run really a life or death issue? Is it worrying about what other people might think about us? Are we consumed with the actions or inactions of other people? We're all up in their business, which is none of our own. Are we gossiping, spreading lies laced with our own worries and intentions? Are we spending more time worrying about other people and other things because we're just too scared to hold a magnifying glass up to our own lives? (sighs) He's in the room with us. What matters to you? Is it the plight of the needy, the poor, the vulnerable? Is it the care of the sick, the broken, the lonely? Is it feeding the hungry, the, cloth- the clothing of the naked? Is it naming the demons and casting them out of our personal and political lives? Is it seeking and speaking truth in order that the blind see? What matters to us? It, it is easy to read Amos and look at our lives and our world right now and think, Maybe God has left the building. 
The famine has come to the land, and people are thirsty and hungry for the word of God. For a word that, when spoken, rings true, even if it's uncomfortable. Authentic, honest, people are yearning for good news, gospel good news. We are so hungry, so empty, we are trying to fill the voids in our lives, in our relationships, in our communities with stuff and more stuff. The one with the most toys at the end of their lives wins. Remember that bumper sticker? We make up stories and conspiracies. We drink more, smoke more, eat more, fear more, hate more, worry more. What matters more to us? Housework, homework, or heart work? Does the well-being of our neighbor mean more to us than our own? (sighs) Martha, 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 put down your towel and come listen. Come and allow yourself to engage God in community. Mary has chosen the better part. Yes, you matter and you are appreciated, but the dishes will still be there. I have a cousin in my house. There's always dishes. The dust will forever accumulate. Right now, breathe and rest and open yourself to learning about the fact, the truth, that you are loved. You are to love others as I have loved you. Come and learn about the light that resides in each and every one of us. Come, be still, and know that God is was, and ever shall be. Martha, you do you. Let Mary be Mary. This right here, this moment, this conversation, these prayers are what matter the most right now. Come and join us. Think about your own lives. Who do we know who would benefit with this kind of conversation with this kind of community experience? Who could use some time away from their to-do list to engage their to-be list? Who needs to be still? Who needs to be loved, to be healed, to be held, to be welcomed, to be valued, to be heard? to be set free, to be forgiven, to be trusted, equipped, and sent out to be love in the world. Who do we know who needs to be invited? And maybe, maybe our own names were on your list, and that's okay. Thanks be to God that we chose to be here today. We chose to prioritize time with God in God's community in this moment, whether we're present in this building right now or watching it online later in the week. Thank God for those decisions. Amen. Thank you.
Holy One, we come before you with our hearts open. And each one of us has experience in your world, in our communities. We come with our own prayers before you. In this time, we offer you our prayers for your world. A world where we don't see the borders. We just see humans in need of you. We pray for places suffering under the weight of war. We pray for our refugees, refugees from violence, refugees from climate crisis. We pray for all those folks on the ground like the Doctors Without Borders, the various medical groups, the various refugee groups, all who seek to help people on the ground all over this world. We pray for their strength and their safety. We give thanks for their courage and their love. We pray for our own country, our countries of origin. We, we pray for those who are traveling, traveling locally and globally. Keep them safe, bring them home safely. We pray for all of the communities that we are a part of in Kitimat, the people that we, we play with, the people we pray with, the ones we work with the ones we serve beside, all of the various communities, we pray. We pray for our churches. We pray for faith communities here and around the world, that they be places of, of welcome, of compassion, that they be places that inspire people to go out into your world and love. We take this time to pray for our friends and our families. We lift up prayers for ourselves. And we join these prayers together, the prayers that are too deep for words, with the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, that we sing together now.
Thank you to all of you here today uh, and those who are at home for your faithful and joyful support for First United Church and its varied ministries with your financial gifts through your prayers and being present in so many different ways. And for folks from the Anglican Church, if you wish to leave an envelope and clearly mark Anglican Church, we set those aside. From here, we, we have the plate just behind Sue at the end of the um, aisle here. Uh, we still don't pass the plate because of COVID, so if you have an envelope, you're welcome to leave it there. We also have, of course, PAR, our pre-authorized remittance. You can sign up for a monthly giving to the church, and you don't even have to be from Kitimat from that. You could, you could live in London, England, and sign up for PAR here, right? Wouldn't that be great? Because I think the pound, pound sterling is worth more too, isn't it? So where, wherever you are, you can sign up for PAR or you can send an e-transfer. And I think, do we have a slide here, uh, Wolf, that has the, yes. So we've got instructions for our e-transfers or you can mail a check to the church. All of your support is, is greatly welcomed. We also, have, of course, we have the um, mission and service fund. I think you're going to share the story, or do we have a video? Do we have a video? Video? Something. Mission and service fund, the United Church, which serves locally and globally mission initiatives. We also have the healing fund, which uh, helps with our indigenous ministries within the United Church and our work towards reconciliation and healing. So what, however you choose to give, um, thank you so much. Uh, bless you all for your, for your generosity. And I think we'll have our minute for mission. Many attempt to cross the Strait of Gibraltar from Morocco to Europe. In the last two years, the number of refugees and asylum seekers in Morocco have more than doubled. Today, a country is both a transit and host country with 19,620 refugees and asylum seekers. Each person arrives in Morocco hoping for a better life for themselves and their family. Many attempt to cross the Strait of Gibraltar from Morocco to Europe. Some make the 14 kilogram, 14 kilometer trip, others don't because it proves too costly and dangerous. To give you an idea of what this trip looks like, they get on an inflated boat, normally made for 10 to 20 people, and there are more than 40 people on it, hoping that the wind, their manual maneuvers, and God will get them to Europe. And they pay thousands of euros to get on that boat. Wright, Fritz, Joseph, and Amelia Lukit, who served for four years in Morocco with the United Church in partnership with Global Ministries of the Disciples of Christ. <clears throat> Each day we hear of people who die trying to cross over. A lot don't even get to know how to swim. Many of those wishing to cross the sea and ultimately go to Europe are and still are living in scarcity and poverty because they have used their money to get to Morocco. Every country they must cross requires fees for passage. So when arriving in Morocco, they must find a way to pay for their next and final trip to Europe. In Morocco, your service and mission, mission and service gifts support refugees and migrants by providing life-saving medication, as well as blankets, food, clothes, and professional training. Without the help of partners, none of this tremendous help that is offered to migrating people in Morocco would be possible. None, explained Fritz and Emiliana. Helping migrants is one of the biggest ministries of the church. We are there for people who have nowhere else to go. This is one story of how your generosity through mission and service helps change lives. Thank you for your gifts.
holy love, bless these gifts, bless the givers, bless our efforts to help bring more love and more light into your world. Bless our efforts to establish your realm of equitable justice and inclusive welcome on earth. Bless it all that we be a blessing to one another. Amen. So let's go forth from here with our arms wide open and our heads held high and with love in our hearts because each one of us is beautiful, handsome, loved by God. No matter what happens, we must always remember that. Let's go out and follow the dream that God has for us. Go and invite others on the journey. And if the dream changes, let's build new dreams with God and follow those. Go out and change the world as Christ has changed our lives. And as we go, know that God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, goes with us today, tomorrow, and always. And the people say, Amen. Amen.